the uh, cover of the Rainier Valley Citizen Annual of 1915, published by the Rainier Valley Citizen, the Columbia City newspaper at that time. It has about 75 wonderful photographs, many articles about the events and people during that era. Many of the slides you see today will be from the Citizen Annual. We will start the slideshow with a series of slides about the Wildwood Lane Trolley Stop, one of the last surviving stops in the city. This slide showed the plans for restoring the trolley stop, which was just recently completed. This uh, slide shows Wildwood Lane on Rainier Avenue, about halfway between uh, Othello Street and Rainier Beach, as it appeared in the Rainier Valley Citizen Annual in 1915. The house on the right is still there today. This pedestrian lane, not paved in the early days, went up the hill and then down to the lake to a resort hotel called Twin Furs. This is a photo of the early trolley stop prior to 1915. The streetcar at the left was an open-sided car. Note the tracks, the ties, and the Rainer Avenue planks. They were all apparently brand new. No weeds or grass, so they must have been just installed. The slide was from the Museum of History and Industry. Now if take a look down in the distance. You see the gazebo-like structure in the background. This is a close-up of that original trolley stop. Note the bridge over the culvert over to Rainer Avenue and the name Wildwood on the structure. This is a pedestrian bridge we like to think was part of the trail that went to the resort. It was in with some other photos of that same era. So until someone tells us otherwise, we kind of like to assume it was part of that uh, trail that went down to the, uh, to the Twin Firs. We're assuming that it was, and it's kind of fun to do this. may not be correct, but uh, until we find otherwise, it makes for a good story. And this next slide comes under the same category. We aren't sure where this was taken. But wouldn't it be um, logical for guests at the hotel to be taking a cooling, cooling off dip in the lake? Don't laugh, one of them may be your grandmother. Unfortunately, there were no names on the back of that photo. This next series of nine slides is from the Hostler family. The family album was loaned to us to copy by Jack Stevens and Roseanne Nelson, grandchildren of Reinhold, Reinhold Hostler. This first slide is of the first Hostler grocery store on the northwest corner of Rainier and Graham Street in 1902. Grandma Hostler and daughter are in the doorway. Note the streetcar tracks in front of the porch. Departing passengers could step onto the front porch from the streetcar. This is a portrait of Reinhold Hostler. And this slide is a second grocery store built at Rainier and Rose Street. The family lived upstairs. Rainier Avenue, as you can see there, one lane was between the store and the car tracks. And planks covered Rainier Avenue at that time. These are the horse-drawn delivery wagons of Mr. Hosler. This store called Atlantic City Grocery. And this was part of the town of Atlantic City that existed for a short time in the Rainier Beach area. I didn't know about this town, but when I found out there was one, it explains why the park at Rainier Beach was named Atlantic City. Prior, this uh, park was changed recently to Beersheba a few years ago. This is another view of the store, a little later when they had an automobile for deliveries. They had a meat market to the right of the store. Mr. Hosser decided to build a new building in front of the old one. This slide shows four teams of horses excavating for the foundation. 
Rainer Avenue had been relocated to the west about a hundred feet. This is the construction crew that built the brick building. Mr. Hostler is to the left in front of the white horse. Do you recognize the building? Now you probably do. It is still there today on the east side of Rainier at Rose. The old grocery store was taken down and remains a vacant lot. This is the interior of the Hostler store, probably in the 30s. Note the front center, a display of Kicks cereal. Did you know they had cereal back then? Now we will go to the other end of Rainier Valley, the site of Six Stadium. It was the site of the old Dugdale Baseball Park that burned in a spectacular fire on July 5, 1932. This slide shows the construction of the Six Stadium in the 30s. Uh, it, started, it was opened, it was built in 1937, and the first uh, game was played in 1938. Note the vegetable patch on the hill in the foreground. This is an aerial view in the early 40s of the completed ballpark. The vegetable patch is there in, in, next to the stadium. To the left, across Rainier, is Vaca's vegetable store called Pree's Garden Patch. Just to the south of that was the tent building that housed the 3GI's surplus store. This was taken opening day at the Rainier Ballpark, 6th Stadium. Fred Hutchinson was the ball player in the center. He was just out of Franklin High where he had a very successful career as a pitcher. The Detroit Tigers offered him a contract to play for them and Fred's dad, Dr. Bill Hutchinson Sr., asked for a $5,000 signing bonus and they turned it down. He played for the Rainiers and had a very successful year, 17 wins and I believe 5 losses. The next year Detroit offered him a contract for $50,000 which he accepted and the rest is history. This is Tightwad Hill, Pree's garden patch where you could catch uh, <laughs> or watch the game for free. Note Franklin High in the distance. Another shot in Pree's garden. These two slides are courtesy of the Mohai Museum. This is the 1940 Seattle Rainiers baseball team, twice Pacific Coast League champion, pennant winners. The old timers will recognize the names Dick Geisman, Bill Lawrence, Dick Barrett, Jojo White, Ido Vanny, and others. Leo Lassen, the tremendously popular radio announcer for, for the Rainiers, in, on, in out of town games, he would recreate the games with all the background noise from just reading the teletype that came on. He was noted for his description of a home run. We have a recording of his broadcasts given to us by Helen McElroy, one of our members. Well, he knocked it down anyway. The runner's in and Moore's on second. Fletcher knows. Looks at Grazzle. Goes into the wind wind up. Here comes that ball. Uh, it's a high fly back to the left field wall. Back, 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 back. And it's over! Leo was one of our local Rainier Valley boys, and the Lassen home was remodeled into the existing Columbia Funeral Home. This is a sellout crowd of 17,000 at Six Stadium, which they had most of the time. The overflow fans were put along the foul lines and onto the outfield next to the fence. Note the peanut vendor to the right of the left fielder. That was baseball as it should be played. This is the start of the demolition of the stadium. These photos were uh, made by Dennis Law, then with the South District Journal and Beacon Hill News. The pilot's sign was still standing at the left of this photo during the 
just during the uh, demolition. The broadcast booth is about to come down in this photo. These slides on Columbia School in Columbia City, this is the original school built in 1892. It was one of the final, first three structures built in Columbia, the others being the town hall and a church. They were built with a lot of volunteer labor. Students were attending class on the first floor when work was progressing on the second. It served an area six miles along the streetcar track and one mile on either side. This uh, is the 1899 graduating class. Note the dresses and suits that were worn. This is one of our favorite photographs. It's the 1911 cooking class at Columbia School. This photo is of Bobby Heater at four years of age. His dad owned the Heater glove which we will show you some photos of uh, that we just acquired from Bobby last month. Of particular interest here, however, is the background, which shows the existing Columbia School under construction in 1923, and the old school at the right with the bell tower just visible. So far as we know, this is the only photo that has both schools shown together. The, the Columbia School bell from the tower was lost for many years and then found and given to the Columbia Pioneers thanks to the efforts of a pioneer Mrs. Morris Pixley. This is a newspaper article when the bell was put on permanent display in the Columbia School entry hall. The people standing around are from the Columbia Pioneers. The next series of slides on the Rainer Valley streetcar lines. The tracks were laid in 1890 and the first Columbia lots were sold in April of 1891. These cars at the top were the first two cars on the Rainer Valley line. One of them was open-ended. In an interview with Will Brown, the motorman, he stated it could get pretty wet and cold sometimes, but, but then at other times it had its advantages. He would take a shotgun along and more often than not, when going through the wooded areas, which Rainier Valley was mostly in those days, he would come home with a bird or two for dinner. This is car number 20, cresting the hill in Columbia City between Edmonds and Ferdinand Street. Nelson Market is on the left. Next to it is Columbia Hardware, then Columbia Funeral, and then next a grocery store on the corner. The path on the right leads to D.C. Brown's house, and the black box on the pole to the right contains a switch for signal lights to let motormen know when the single track is in use. The switch was operated by a pull on the dangling rope. This is car number 18 that ran between Rainer Beach and Renton. This photo was uh, courtesy of the Rainer His Renton Historical Museum. This uh, photo shows the cars in the Hudson Street barns of the Seattle Renton and Southern Railway. Note that Rainier Avenue is planked and also lots of mud. This was 1905 at Rainier Beach, looking east to the station at 57th Avenue South. The car was on the way on its way to Renton, a grocery store and boathouse is on the left. In this slide, a car of the Seattle and Renton line pauses for a picture around a curve south of Rainier Beach Station. The manager of the line, D.W. Brown, is standing at right. April 30th, 1910, car 102, in service for only one month, was hit by a runaway coal car at, a, at the Willow Street. The power failed and the shop built locomotive and coal car separated. There was no emergency braking system. Two people died and 20 were injured. The car was rebuilt and renumbered 109. 
it's uh, there's a story that goes with that that one of the women passengers who jumped to to get away from, uh, before the collision was more concerned than anything else about getting a transfer so she could get on with her ride. This is one of the work cars on the streetcar line. It was built by uh, uh, Hipkins, who was the uh, blacksmith at the car barns. It serviced the line from Renton to downtown Seattle. This is a series of seven slides on the heater glove factory that was located in Columbia City in the 20s and 30s. The first shop shown here was located at the rear of the present site of the Columbia Cafe. These slides were just given to us by Bobby Heater when he came up from California. He's the son of the original owner, Freeman Heater. Bob came up from California three weeks ago, called and said he had some pictures for us. We were delighted. Uh, this photo shows some of the employees of the uh, company standing in front of their enlarged facility on the main floor of the what is now the Ark Temple building in Columbia. This is across Rainier Avenue from Seafirst Bank. This was a panoramic photograph and this is, the, is shown in, in two sections. This is the first half of the photo. This is the other half of the photo. Bob also included a list of names for most of those in the picture. As a boy in the 30s, I would go up to the alley on my way home from uh, school at Columbia School and go through the garbage can for scraps of leather to build slingshots with. This is one of their products, a helmet made of leather, and one just like it was made for Lindbergh on his uh, transatlantic ocean flight. It, his is now in the Smithsonian. These next three slides are of displays in windows uh, of shops down at the Pike Place Market. They were advertising the uh, products of the Heater Glove Company. Uh, I assume that there was some kind of a trade show going on in town. This last one shows workers uh, making uh, leather products in the window. This last series of slides is on the town of Columbia, which started with lots sold in April 1891. This first slide shows the Columbia Mill located at Rainier and Brandon. That's between Hillman and Columbia City. It was the first industrial building in Columbia. It generated power for the streetcar line during the rush hour. One of the streetcars is at the lower left of the picture. This gives you an indication how large the building was. Rainier Valley had one of the finest stands of timber in the state. This photo shows logs waiting for processing. The logs, if you compare them to the man standing next to them, must have been five to six feet in diameter. This is the town of Columbia, about 1894. Note Columbia School bell tower in the background. The picture was taken from about 39th Avenue South. The D.C. Brown home is the one with a peaked roof and still stands today. Brown was Columbia City Marshal for a time and was a great-grandfather to Buzz Anderson, president of Rainier Valley Historical Society. This was Columbia City's first grocery store on a knoll at Rainier and Ferdinand Street, the northeast corner, on its opening day in 1892. It was owned by Mr. Grote. This is the Hepler Grocery on the northwest corner of Ferdinand and Rainier. Note the Columbia School bell tower in the background. The balcony on the left of the building was the scene of musical performances to entertain the people in the, in the area. The Knights of Pythias Hall is the building with the turrets up the street a little ways. It was burned in a fire in 1941 and the upper part was destroyed. The lower part was roofed over. It then became the Columbia Bakery. This is the Columbia Hotel, southeast corner of Rainier and Ferdinand. 
It was the first brick building in Columbia in 1892, and it was a residence for the Hellenthal family. Later, about 1904, it was enlarged and became the Columbia and Dakota Hotel. Buffalo Bill Cody signed in the register that we have of the hotel. This is Phelan's grocery in the lower floor of the Ninth Epitheus Hall. The salesman would take orders from door to door in throughout the community, and then in the afternoon the horse-drawn wagons would deliver the groceries. This is Growler the Cat at Phelan's store. I think all the grocery stores had a cat to control the mice. This was the pump engine and the hose reel of the Volunteer Fire Department at Rainier and Hudson. The closest team of horses usually were called on to, to pull the equipment, and the bugler would usually sit up in front and warn the traffic of the, that they were coming. The fire station on the left, and then the city hall, and a pool room to the right of that, and a barber shop. The City Hall building with copula roof is now a duplex at, the Hudson, at Hudson Street and 37, but it has a conventional roof. The Pool Hall later became a tavern, or saloon as they called them in those days. Until annexed by the city of Seattle, Columbia prided itself in not having a single saloon within the city limits. The Murphy Sign Company photo was donated to, by, to us by Roberta Davis, uh, this Mr. Murphy's daughter. Uh, she lives in Vancouver, Washington. Note the date on the sign in front of the uh, store. We're unsure of the location, but we know that it was in Columbia City. And this is the inside of the shop with Mr. Murphy. Note the signs of the era and the prices. This is a photo of Smith Wilson in a, next to his dairy truck. He had a dairy on the northeast corner of Rainier and Hudson. Later became an ice cream shop. Later he built a dairy building at Rainier and Adams Street, as shown in the photo. This, was, uh, the pres this is the present site of the Dairy Gold building, which was uh, not a successor to his dairy, however. Smith Wilson merged with Christofferson Dairy and then left them to become port com Seattle Port Commissioner for three terms. Mr. Forrester from Issaquah came in from Issaquah and perhaps took over the site and started Alpine Dairy, later Dairy Gold. This is the library just after opening in 1916. Money was donated to build this building and many others throughout the country by Andrew Carnegie. This, of course, is the new rain. Thank you for attending the show.